Good morning. Welcome to all of you gathered here on this Mother's Day. A special welcome to our mothers and grandmothers among us. Some excitement in the crowd, I can hear that. Others of us come here, tired, busy week, we come to rest in the Lord, whether we're filled with energy or not, and it's good to be here. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you could join us today, and if you're watching, welcome to you as well. <clears throat> Revelation 7, verses 9 through 12, as our call to worship. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor, and power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Wonderful call to worship. I read it fairly regularly. Picture of what it's like in heaven. All the angels and the saints there and all the living creatures, as described, bowing down before God and before Jesus Christ, the Lamb, worshiping Him, praising Him with all glory that He deserves. Let's open our service singing, Oh, for a thousand ton tongues to sing, as we join our voices to the voices in heaven, praising our great and glorious God. Great and glorious God, he greets us as we gather before his face to worship him. Receive a greeting from him. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory with the Son and the Spirit forever and ever. Amen. We're singing about God's grace and his love for us. We're going to celebrate that in just a moment in the Lord's Supper. Our next song, And Can It Be? brings to us the profound mystery that God would extend his love and his grace to sinners like us.
be seated. I'll invite the elders forward. As I said, that hymn recites for us the wonderful story of God's grace and love and mercy that is extended to us in Jesus Christ. Sit on the chairs today. <laughs> we have room. And we see that wonderful story in the life of Jesus and the life that he gave up for us that we celebrate that sacrament in the sacrament that God, Jesus Christ, God the Son, came and offered his body, his blood, as a sacrifice for us. In the congregation of our Lord, hear these words from the Apostle Paul. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The sacrament of sharing in Christ's body and blood has multiple layers of meaning. These meanings are conveyed to us in the, by the different names that we give for this celebration that Jesus has initiated and instituted. The word Lord's Supper conveys that Jesus himself is the host of this supper and that we celebrate this feast in obedience to Christ. We also call this communion, which highlights the fact that we experience an intimate union both with our Savior and with our fellow believers. And Eucharist is based on the Greek word which means thanksgiving. It names this feast as a meal of gratitude and thanks, just as the Last Supper was for Jesus and his disciples a meal of thanksgiving. And so today we celebrate this sacrament as a meal of thanksgiving that Jesus Christ has provided so that we can be united together with him. The people of the Lord Jesus Christ, this the Lord has prepared this table for all who love Him and trust in Him alone for their salvation. And so all who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who desire to live in obedience to Him as Lord, you are all now invited to this table of gladness to share in this meal. So let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. and Let us give thanks and praise to God for providing salvation through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let's pray. Holy Father, in thankfulness and gratitude for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and in the joy of his resurrection and in the hope of his return, we present ourselves as a living sacrifice to you, our Lord, and we come before this table of remembrance and thanksgiving. And with joy we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth, you made us in your image, and you, the ever-faithful God, have kept covenant with us even though we have fallen into sin. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for offering yourself so that by your life, your death, and your resurrection, you have opened to us the way to eternal life. God of love and mercy and grace, we pray, send your Holy Spirit upon us and make our sharing in the bread and the cup a sharing in Christ's body and blood. Nourish our souls until eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of you has to stay. <laughs> People of God, these are the gifts of God for His children. And the bread that we break is a sharing in the body of our Savior, Jesus Christ.
People of God, take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Savior was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup that we share is the sharing in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's grape juice in the center ring for those that would like that. Take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Savior was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. We finish this meal with a simple Acclamation of praise to our Savior for this tremendous gift that He has given to us. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Indeed, Jesus Christ deserves all of this from us, His people. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we thank You that You have fed us in this sacrament, that You have united us with Jesus Christ, and You have given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet the supper that is to come when our Savior returns and brings us into His eternal kingdom. Lord Jesus, we thank You and we bless Your holy name for having celebrated communion with You in the supper and with one another, this meal that You instituted as a remembrance of Your great sacrifice that saves and redeems sinners. And We pray, Holy Spirit, cause us now to walk with our Savior in joy and thanks all the days of our lives, Fill us with love and gratitude for the gift of Christ's life that saves us from our sin. Remind us that we belong to Him and that our lives are His. And help us always to be ready for our Lord's return. In the name of our Savior and Lord we pray. Amen. This time we're going to stand and we'll sing Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. Rock 
of ages glad. See, the elders aren't the only ones who are confused about where to sit, hey? You're all trying to sit on that far end? That's okay. You won't be here too long. You guys are going to go off to Sunday school, right? Study God's Word. We just had Lord's Supper. Did you hear what I said about Lord's Supper, some of what I said? You know, who, who does this remind us of? And who specifically? Jesus. And what? Exactly. He died on the cross, right? And we say He gave His body for us and His blood was shed for us. I know it's pretty profound, right? That's a big word too. It's a mystery we don't understand. We see what He did. We, understand, we can understand it a bit. But one day we'll know fully just what His gift of His sacrifice meant, means to us, right? So let's bow our heads. We're going to pray and thank Jesus again for His great gift, but also thank Him for the Word. Okay, let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that whether we partook or just observed this morning, we could see in this supper your love for us, your love in sending Jesus to live and die in our place. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Word made flesh, that you dwelt among us and you showed us how we ought to live. And now as we turn to your Word, we pray that you would help us to learn how to live for you, how to live like you, to follow you, whether young or old, in the footsteps of that you laid down for us, Lord Jesus. So bless us and the Sunday school children and their teachers, Lord. Bless us so that we can be a blessing to the world around us. We pray this in, his, in Jesus' name. Amen.
okay, now you can stand up and face the people. Okay, you're ready. Let's bless the children saying, the Lord be with you. Thank you very much. You guys can go off to Sunday school. <laughs> and invite those of us here in the sanctuary or at home to turn to Matthew chapter 5 once again. We continue and conclude our look at the Beatitudes, that portion of the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Our focus will be on verses 9 through 12, but let me read verses 1 through 12 as our in its entirety. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, <clears throat> persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. So this is our third and final look at the Beatitudes that start off our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And in each of the titles of these Beatitudes sermons, I included our Lord's title, which is Christ. And I included reference to our Lord because He is the prototype for kingdom living. And the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, they're all about how to live as Christ's kingdom people. Once we're admitted into Christ's kingdom through faith in Him, how Jesus describes here is how we must live. We are to live like Christ when he was on earth. And I want to make it clear again so we aren't mistaken on the order of salvation. God saves sinners by granting them faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That faith, faith in Jesus is what allows a sinner to, end, to gain entry into God's kingdom. Faith in Jesus sets his people on the path of becoming like him. And Christians follow in our Lord's footsteps and his, in His likeness because we are in His kingdom. When we realize that we are not like Jesus because of our sin, we become poor in spirit. We mourn over our sin and we hunger and thirst for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God grants us His righteousness. For now, Christians who are righteous in standing because of faith in Jesus, we, God sees us that way. And that's what we mean when we say we are justified. We are made right with God. Only the righteous can live in God's presence. But progressively, this righteousness that we receive from Jesus Christ, it grows in us, it manifests in all Christians. That righteousness growing is what we call sanctification. And to be sanctified is to be set apart from that which is not holy. And so if we claim to be Christians, we must leave our sin behind. We must be growing in righteousness. This process is becoming pure in heart that Jesus speaks of here in the Beatitudes. And the goal of our salvation is to have a heart as pure as the heart of Jesus. And when our hearts are more pure and become fully pure, we will be just like him. Today we look at the last two Beatitudes about peacemakers and being persecuted. Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker. And for his work of peacemaking, he was persecuted. And we just celebrated the results of that persecution 
in the Lord's Supper. To be proper peacemakers, we need to define what Jesus means by peacemaking. So what is this peace that Jesus and his kingdom promote? What does this peace look like? What does his peace accomplish? Well, the answer, again, lies in looking in the life at the life of Jesus. What did Jesus come to earth to do? And what did he accomplish? Jesus came to earth to provide a path for sinners to get back to God. Sinners are cut off from God because of their sin. They're unholy. God can't tolerate anything unholy in his presence. Sinners are enemies of God because of their sin. Sinners are at war with God because of their sin and sinfulness. Jesus came to provide peace with God for sinners who could never stop on their own being at war with God. The only way for sinners to find peace with God is if their hearts are changed and their sin is dealt with. That's where Jesus comes in, and that's why Jesus came to earth. We often say Jesus pays for the sins of his people. That's true. Jesus also bestows his people with his own righteousness. And the Holy Spirit replaces stony, sinful hearts of sinners who are at war with God with the heart of Jesus. And through all this, Jesus provides the path of peace with God that we desperately need. The peace that Jesus speaks of here in this beatitude is having peace with God. Christ's kingdom peacemakers, then, are to carry on our Lord's work of peacemaking. When he says, blessed are the peacemakers, we might say, he goes on to say, blessed are the peacemakers who do their part to make peace between people and God. Our job as Christians, little Christs, is to continue bringing true peace that our Lord makes possible. Now, we don't pay for sin. Only Jesus can do that. But we can point people to Jesus who alone pays for sin. And if the Holy Spirit gives people that we point to Jesus Christ, if he gives them faith in him and the Lord, they will find peace with God. So again, we don't provide a path across that great chasm of sin that separates people from God. But we point people to Jesus, the one who alone bridges that great gap, that chasm between sinners and God. Another aspect of peacemaking is truth-telling. Jesus declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we point people to Jesus, then we are pointing people to the truth. We point people to the truth by proclaiming and living out our Lord's truth. His truth is found primarily in the words of Scripture, in the record of His life. In His example, we find what it truly means to live as people of God. Part of truth-telling, though, has to deal with calling out sin. Again, there can be no peace with God where sin is allowed to fester, where sin is allowed to corrupt and destroy. We often hear people say, we just need to keep the peace, or do whatever it takes so that we can be at peace with everyone. This often means keeping our mouths shut even when lies are being told. Keeping peace often means not challenging what's wrong and what's not truth. Now some of you may be thinking of the passage where it says, be at peace with everyone. That's from Romans 12. But hear the whole verse. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If the you in that verse is a Christian, and it is, and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the truth, then there are limits to living at peace with everyone. And one limit for Christians is that we are not to compromise God's truth. And another limit is we must call out sin for what it is. False or fake peace, that has always been a problem, and the Bible exposes it. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel, two Old Testament prophets, they address the problem of false peace or fake peace. Twice Jeremiah says this, They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. And Ezekiel says, 
because they lead my people astray, saying, Peace, when there is no peace, and because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Pretty condemning uh, judgments on the people, the leaders of the day. The false prophets, the false leaders of the people, they were promoting fake, false peace. They covered over the people's sins and rebellion against God. They treated sin that separates people from God and leads to death and to hell. They treated that sin as no big deal. They whitewashed sin and disobedience to God. And by whitewashing sin, they built flimsy walls of false religions that would fall on the people, metaphorically, of course. Sin not dealt with will bear the full weight of God's wrath. Covered over sin, that is not peace with God, but the exact opposite. It's enmity with God. It's an abomination to God. And the false Old Testament prophets and leaders, they were the exact opposite of peacemakers as Jesus wants his people to be. Well, fast forward to Jesus' day. He also condemns the religious leaders for the same hypocrisy and the same lying as the false peace prophets of the Old Testament. The Pharisees followed their made-up rules thinking they were obedient before God. They twisted God's word. They whitewashed their sin and the people's sin. They trusted in their own man-made rules and works, their false religion of flimsy walls. Jesus calls these Pharisees, these false teachers, whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they looked pure, but on the inside, their hearts were rotten. They were not at peace with God. And even worse, they instructed the people to live like them. They did not promote peace with God. They promoted hostility with God. Jesus calls the Pharisees out for their false peace promotion in the chapter, uh, chapter 23 of Matthew's Gospel. The whole chapter, some 20 some odd verses. He calls the leaders hypocrites, blind guides, and snakes for their obscuring of God's truth. And the result is that the kingdom of heaven, it is shut. The doors of God's kingdom are shut in the people's faces from their false teaching. Without truth, God's truth, people have no access to God. Without accepting God's truth, people never find true peace with God our Creator. The point about peace with God is that it hinges on accepting and obeying the truth of God. And the world around us, it sees so little peace because it rejects God's truth. Countries are experiencing decreasing peace because God's truth is being pushed aside, it's being rejected. Individuals are finding less and less peace in their lives because they are rejecting God's truth. Churches and denominations like ours, they are losing true peace because they deny God's truth. As this trend continues, humanity will only know more and more unrest, more turmoil, more enmity with God. Those who reject God also hate God. Those who hate God also reject His anointed Son and King, the Lord Jesus. Our sin-loving world, it is at war with King Jesus. And Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 10, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Hold on, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. and He's calling himself one who brings a sword, not peace. So is he contradicting himself about peacemaking? Well, no, he's not. He's talking about exposing the reality of humanity's fallenness and the need to expose sin. Jesus Christ is the word made of the word of truth who cuts like a sword through sin, through lies, through anything that is not true. We call Jesus the Prince of Peace, rightly, because that's one of his titles that Isaiah gives him. For Jesus to provide true peace, he had to show the people the reality of their situation. Peace will come, but only after error, sin, and evil are dealt with. But we know what the people did with the message that Jesus brought. They rejected him for his work of bringing true peace. Jesus was persecuted and executed for his peacemaking work. 
Now, to Christ's peacemakers, God says, you are my children, meaning we inherit life with God in his presence. Now, that is the glorious reward for peacemaking. But that reward for peacemaking, and all the ramifications of being God's children, that will come after the duty we need to carry out, which is peacemaking. And with that duty comes facing persecution, just like Jesus faced. That leads us to the next beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom. If you were wondering, does peace really have to do with Jesus Christ and his truth? This beatitude tells us it does. <clears throat> Jesus Christ and his truth, that is righteousness. He is righteousness. He is the source of all righteousness. He was crucified for being God's righteousness. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers for his righteousness. The result is that we will receive persecution in return. Here, right at the start of his teaching, his ministry, Jesus tells his followers they can expect a life of opposition. And he'll repeat that warning many times throughout his three-year ministry. Like in John chapter 15, he says to his people, his followers, his disciples, remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent them, who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for, for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. So there you get a sense that Jesus came to expose sin, <clears throat> but to also offer the solution to that sin that produces war with God. The people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear what Jesus had to say. They hate Jesus for exposing their sin, that barrier that destroys their peace with God. And with that evil unrest in their hearts, they killed Jesus. This passage in John 15 it reveals what is behind Jesus' words here in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly these verses from the, of the Beatitudes. This passage in John, that is Jesus' warning for all who profess faith in Jesus Christ, for all who profess faith in His name and His truth. And yet, Christians in North America, including us, we have experienced very little persecution compared to Christians in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East. So is Jesus wrong? Was his warning misplaced? Did Jesus not see the future for Western Christians in our day? Well, no, the Bible is not wrong. And no, Jesus was not dark or out of touch with the future. So if the Bible and Jesus are not wrong, then why are Western Christians not experiencing more persecution? Well, part of the reason is very pragmatic. At least in the last century, Western society tolerated Christianity. It tolerated what we, the Bible and the teachings that we get from it. But another reason has to do with Christians as individuals and as the church failing to promote God's truth. If Christians don't experience persecution for pro proclaiming Christ and living like Christ, and they likely are not proclaiming Christ or living like Christ in peacemaking ways. If Christians aren't experiencing persecution, they likely aren't defending and promoting God's truth and not calling out sin as vigorously as they ought to. And we, have to decide, we have to examine ourselves. Are we part of that? To escape persecution, the church neuters the gospel. It neutralizes the gospel by taking out the sting about repentance and mourning over our sin. It disarms the gospel by avoiding talking about sin and hell. The church even goes to the point of avoiding declaring that Jesus is the only way to salvation and to heaven and back to God. The church follows society by rejecting God's truth and accepting sinful living as okay. Now, Western Christians, they often think that a life of ease, a life of getting along with society, 
that that's a blessing from God. And if we're honest, we talk like that too, don't we? We look at our abundance. We look at our relatively easy lives compared to the rest of the world. And what do we think? Or what do we say? We think, well, God has really blessed us. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus is teaching us here in this passage about his kingdom people. Jesus says, the peacemakers, peacemakers who are persecuted, they are the blessed. Those who are persecuted for po- promoting righteousness, they are the blessed sons and daughters of God. If we're honest, and I'm honest here too, I'd rather avoid insults. I'd rather avoid people falsely saying all kinds of evil about me on account of Jesus Christ. And we do that, we avoid all that persecution by not giving an account of Jesus. But as a result of avoiding being open with the gospel of Jesus Christ and being quiet about our faith in Jesus, we avoid true blessing from God. Blessings like joy in all circumstances, the blessing of assurance of salvation, the assurance of our faith, the blessing that hope in God, a hope that cannot die, we avoid all that when we keep our faith quiet. In Matthew 23, Jesus talks about the Old Testament prophets who were persecuted. Those were not the prophets who went around, the false prophets that went around proclaiming peace, peace, when there was no peace with God. No, Jesus is talking about the prophets whose writings are here in the Old Testament in our Bibles. Many of them were persecuted. Many were ridiculed and made fun of. And many of them feared for their lives when having to go out and call call out unrighteous, sin-loving kings. When the prophets of God had to chastise kings for leading Israel and the people into sin, they faced the king's wrath. Many of them were imprisoned, killed. The last Old Testament prophet was John the Baptist. He had to call out King Herod for his incestuous immorality. John promoted righteousness but he did that by calling out sin. If you know his end, you know the result of that work, promoting righteousness. King Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. And Jesus says something remarkable in how his kingdom people must react to this persecution. He says, rejoice and be glad in heart. That's how Christians are to face persecution. So not only should we expect persecution as Christ's followers, We should also rejoice and be glad when it happens. Rejoice and be glad, says Jesus, when persecution comes our way. Whatever pushback we face on account of Jesus Christ, that is confirmation that we belong to him, that we are in his eternal kingdom, that we are sons and daughters of God Almighty. That reality and that truth that Jesus Christ and his kingdom are ours That is our reason to rejoice and be glad, especially when the world attacks us. Peter and Paul, they both repeat what Jesus says here about suffering persecution for doing the Lord's work. Both of them learned the lesson well because they lived out the truth of Jesus Christ and what Jesus says here in verses 10 through 12. They lived it out. Both Peter and Paul were executed for living the kingdom way of life. Many martyrs have followed in their footsteps, in the footsteps of John the Baptist, and the Old Testament faithful prophets. Many Christians have experienced the blessedness of persecution. I know that sounds odd to our ears, the blessedness of persecution. The Western church is beginning to experience what it means to stand up for Jesus. Our sin-loving society is becoming intolerant of true Christianity of God's Word. We are heading into hostile environments, an environment that the church in China, and North Korea, and Palestine, and many other nations, that church faces every single day, that kind of persecution. So what will we do as Christians here in Canada? Will we see persecution as a sign of God's blessedness? Will we willingly accept insults, and false accusations, oppression, even death, with rejoicing and gladness? Time will tell. This is the mission 
of our Savior, Lord, and King. And this is what He's calling us to. This is the life of living in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I pray for all of us, including myself, that the Holy Spirit will give us characters of righteousness so that we will bless our King and we will be blessed in return. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen and empower us to fight for the Gospel, fight for the truth of Jesus Christ and God's Word. With all these Beatitudes, Jesus promises His kingdom people great rewards. Those rewards and His promises, they are coming but they will come after the war is over. It's something sobering to be reminded of, that we're in a war, and it won't end until Christ calls us home or He returns. So let's put on the armor, the spiritual armor, and let's fight in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, through our Savior, You've given us this great, tremendous mission to be your kingdom people, to live lives that reflect Jesus Christ, the King of your kingdom. This is a hard challenge for each and every one of us. Whatever society we live in, it is a challenge to promote and to to defend the truth of Christ, to promote peacemaking by calling out sin. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would indeed Give us strength and power to fight for the gospel, the full gospel, the full truth of Jesus Christ. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would give us all characters of righteousness so that we will be a blessing to our King, so that we will faithfully reflect Him to the world around us, so that we may be a blessing to this world that is dying because of sin, a world that is corrupted, broken because of sin. Use us, Lord, as we talk about in the next passage, to be salt and light to this dying and decaying world that lives in darkness. Help us to see, Lord, that there is great reward for giving our lives in service to Jesus Christ, our King, and the work of the kingdom. We see some of that reward here through the blessing of assurance of faith, of having joy no matter our circumstances, of having a hope that cannot die, and being embraced in your love, Lord God, a love that cannot be taken away. So with the taste of reward, let us go forth boldly in the name of Jesus and know that the full reward is coming for all who faithfully live for Jesus Christ and His truth. We pray this all in His name. Amen. We're going to sing as a song of response, O Jesus, I have promised. We'll stand to sing that song. We could have sung a few others. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Onward, Christian soldiers. Songs that call us to the fight in the name of Jesus. Well, let's stand together and sing, O Jesus, I have promised.
Let's turn to God in prayer. Let's lift up our joys, our concerns, our needs before Him. Let's pray. We thank You, Lord, for gathering on this glorious day, this beautiful day that You've blessed us with. Not only is the weather glorious, but Your truth is glorious. Your grace and Your mercy, which we've talked about and sung about and tasted in the Lord's Supper, that is a glorious thing. We thank You for it. We thank You that You are our Creator, our Redeemer, the One who sustains us, holds us in Your hands forever. We thank You, Lord, for this day that is set aside as Mother's Day. We thank You for those who have nurtured us in this way, our mothers, whether biological or not, Lord, the women in our lives who have nurtured us in your ways and shown us your love through their efforts and activities in our lives, Lord. We pray for our mothers and grandmothers, those who are waiting to become mothers. We pray that you be near them, give them all that they stand in need of to carry out this role. We thank you, Lord, for family, the opportunity to gather together to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and weddings. We pray for your blessing upon Colin and Rebecca and Jeremy and Carly, who were united in marriage yesterday. We pray, Lord, that you would work powerfully in their lives and in their marriages, Lord, that you would be the light that guides them as they now embark officially as husband and wife. In a world, Lord, that breaks down marriage and a world that breaks down the family unit, keep them strong. Keep all of us strong, Lord, in our marriages and our families. We pray that you would give us all that we stand in need of to endure with one another, for we are all broken sinners. and Sometimes we are unbearable for our partners, for our children, or our parents. Remind us, Lord, to show grace and mercy to one another. Help our families to be places of truth, that our families, big or small, may be places where Christ is lifted up, where He is named as Lord. We pray, Lord, that where there's brokenness, that reconciliation may happen, that healing may happen. Pray, Lord, for those who are grieving. Think of the Van Rutselaars, Van Heerdens, and Van Driestens, Lord. We pray that you be near them as they continue to mourn Effie's passing. Give them what they stand in need of. We thank you that you called your daughter Effie home to celebrate her life on Friday. And the joy that, and the mo- role model that she was to her family and to our community. Lord, we Thank you for the rain and the sun that you have provided this week. We see the crops sprouting out of the ground, Lord, a testament to your faithfulness, a testament to your creative powers, Lord, as the seasons change and we move from one to the next, this wonderful season of spring when your world here greens up, showing new life, not only through plants, but also through the animals being born. We thank you, Lord, for safety. In this busy season, we ask that that may continue. Remind us, Lord, whatever our vocation, whatever we do, that our lives rest in your hands and we are dependent dependent on you. We pray, Lord, for our neighbors, Baron and Vicky, as they continue to deal with the vandalism that they experienced at their store and gas station. We pray, Lord, that through this trying time, you work in their lives and uh, spread your light, Lord, as they deal with that big nuisance in their lives. And just pray, Lord, that things may be cleaned up and and fixed up there in in town. We pray for others, Lord, in our families or in our circles of influence, whether at work or school, uh, for those we know and care about who are going through hard time. We ask that you be near them. Whatever they're facing, Lord, may we be... um, a balm and a, and a joy in their lives. May we bring them hope, Lord, that rests in Jesus. Give us words to speak to those who are hurting. Sometimes words 
don't, aren't needed, are just our presence is needed. So help us to be that, Lord, to be your hands and feet, to be your comfort to those in need. We pray, Lord, uh, continue to bless us and go with us this day, whatever lies ahead. <clears throat> May, make us mindful that we are to live for you, we are to work for you, study for you, do all things for you and for your honor and glory. So that, may that truth guide us in all that we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the deacons will come around shortly with uh, the plates and the baskets. The first, the plate is for world renew and the work of um, being Christ's agents of mercy in the world. And then the baskets are for our benevolence fund, helping those more locally who need a helping hand. And while the collections being uh, gathered, we'll sing. Uh, the church is one foundation, and you can remain seated for that. The church is one foundation.
Amen. As you go out into the world around us, go with the Lord's blessing. May our ascended and reigning Lord and King strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all His holy ones. Amen. Closing song, Lead on, O King Eternal.